My name is Gianni Russo, a.k.a. Carlo, the infamous son-in-law from The Godfather. I'm now known as the Hollywood Godfather, and this is my story. Before all of the wins in my portfolio, I was a little boy diagnosed with polio. Experimenting with cures, I tried every one. Felt everything in my right, but my left was numb. Walking with a limp, like will I ever run? Once again, or is this it? Am I forever done? Living in the hospital was never fun. Some people were cool, but not everyone. Welcome, everybody. It's time for another Hollywood Godfather. And tonight, <clears throat> we're going to introduce a new format. We've been doing this a while, and we're listening to you people. In fact, there's one lady, when I introduce Je Jeannie, <clears throat> she will tell us about her request, and then it, it just opened a can of worms. My co-host, Jeannie Raymond. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us again today. We've got some, some new stuff to talk about, and I am super excited about this topic. And we got an email from a gal named Rebecca. So I'm just going to read you the email, and we'll just take it from there. My name is Rebecca. I am reading with much glee your book, The Hollywood Godfather. You have lived quite a life. I am doing some writing of my <clears> own. <throat> it's a bit of a new vocation for me, but I'm determined to be successful. Good luck. I'm excited to hear it. There you so go. I, yeah, I am very excited. I am doing some writing of my own. I'm currently focusing on a story of Dr. Elias Ghanem. Ghanem. Good and friend of mine. It is a neat immediate network. Yeah, Gianni, I'm sure you're going to have some great stories about him as you do with everybody you've been involved with. You've always got something exciting going on. Well, so, what triggered me off, then she went to Chris Caramanis, which was a whole other guy. Absolutely. And I am <clears> so <throat> excited. She said she's um, so excited to write about them and to dig deeper on who he is. And she says, I imagine you have very, you are very busy, but you will be willing to have, if you'll be willing to have a conversation about what you know about him and your time from Vegas. So, well, we're, we're not going to answer all her questions, believe me, because I don't want to be indicted. But yeah. <laughs> she gave so me a great me idea that. because people that, you know, I'm close to me and, you know, Robert Baldacci and, and different people who've always, you know, have been avid fans from day one. Steve Myers and my musical conductor, this guy listens to every show there is. They've all been saying, you know, you have such interesting stories. Why don't you tell more about your stories? So with the cards and letters we've been receiving, like Rebecca's, what I'm planning to do, being that she brought up Vegas, most people don't know, I went to Vegas in 1959. I was in my late teens, and uh, I stayed there for 30 years, in and out. I mean, I owned other businesses, I left. But the majority of the time, my focus was on, on Vegas, and we we're going to find out why. But um, so what I thought, being that we're being encouraged, we're not going to have guests for a while. But we're going to bring you stories and introduce you to people you thought in your life you'd never believe. I mean... In what we're doing in the next 30 years, you're going to find out how I crossed over to meet Elvis Presley and Bobby Vinton and every major, major star in the world. But why I was there in 1959, I was sent there by Frank Costello to be the eyes and ears for him on the weekends while I was traveling the other states trying to get John F. Kennedy nominated as a president. We knew he got nominated in uh, uh, 1960, and then became the president. But with all that said, so here I am in this guy, I've never been there. He says, you got to go to Vegas. I said, okay, no problem. I like Vegas. <laughs> I haven't been, but I heard a lot about it. I think I went once. So I go to Vegas. A car picks me up. It's like a movie at the Las Vegas country, uh, Las Vegas airport. Takes me to Las Vegas Country Club, and I get there, and they take me down to the men's locker room. Now, 
this is where I get, really gets suspicious because we go down, it's members only. He knocks on the door. They let him in. The door wasn't open. And once I got in with him, they locked the door again. Some of the people that were sitting there, now understand, I'm in my late teens. They don't know me. They knew who sent me. And also, I was endorsed by Tony Accardo, every major mobster that had property there or represented property. Because when they laid out Las Vegas, most people don't know this, why there was never any crime there, why there was never any mafia settling a business there, is because they sectioned up the city like the Riviera was Detroit. Um, Chicago had the Stardust, the Desert Inn. New York had the Sands Hotel. And even part of New England, which was the Dunes, they had that. And St. Louis, Rostock, Webby. So you can go down the strip, and I could tell you what families control them. Oh, wow. I get there, all their representatives are there. But not only are they there, Maya Lansky flew in to meet and inter, inter, meet me and introduce me to his man on the ground, Mo Dalitz. Mo Dalitz, you're going to read a lot about this guy. He ran the whole Jewish syndicate there. And while we're talking about Jews, one of the most powerful guys in the United States was Hank Greenspun. Now, Hank Greenspun owned a newspaper called the Las Vegas Sun. But what nobody realized, he was absolute an arms dealer for Israel and funding, funneling money and arms to Israel to get supported. This is when they're just starting up. But when you start to look around the room, and, and then that, what's really sh shocked me, I mean, they introduced me, I'm shaking their hand, they're all looking at me because I'm a, this kid, you know, I, I looked older than I am, but I'm always wearing the right jewelry and brioni suits. And, and as we go around the room, they introduced me to a guy called Perry Thomas. Oh, wow. A nice little guy. And he was the CEO of the Valley Bank out of where you come from, Utah. Yes. Oh, my gosh. It's like a puzzle because I've listened to you. Sorry to interrupt you, but as long as I've been listening to the podcast, I hear these names and, you know, Thomas and Mac and all these different things. And all of a sudden, all these puzzle pieces of all these yeah. people I've heard for so long. And don't forget now, again, it, this is 1959. So a lot of the buildings we knew now weren't even open yet. That's wild. So they introduced me to him. And he, you know, he, he welcomed me to the community. And he gave me a passbook to the bank. What's a passbook? Well, you know, a, a, where, where you when you put money in the bank, they give you oh. a, 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 a which I, I call it a passbook. They call it a bank account. I don't know what. Oh, God. oh, okay, okay. But he went on to say, "I forwarded you a, a million dollar credit line. Okay, if you needed it." <laughs> And I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, I love these guys already. Right. <laughs> but, you know, and when you start thinking about it, and then and again, you know, I'm, I've been already around the mob in so many other places. Then a guy that I, I heard, like a legend, his name was Yale Cohen. Oh. Yale Cohen was Al Capone's bodyguard. Oh, my God. Now he's retired he's there. Yeah, he retired there. And uh, he's running the Stardust Hotel and overseeing other properties. Well, he became one of my best friends until he died. But a long story short, these are the people I'm meeting. And that's why Maya came down. And they were all saying, well, he must be somebody because look, all these people are here. And Maya said, you're going to know this kid as the kid. Don't ask his name. Don't ask our names to give you. There's no, nothing to be here. I mean, you're here for a reason. We need to get JFK nominated to be the president of the United States. And they told them why. That we made a deal to support it. 
because Joe Kennedy said if his son became president, the first thing he would do is invade Cuba and get all the casinos back for them. Because when Fidel Castro raided them and everybody was thrown out, I happened to be there. It wasn't New Year's Eve. It was two days after Christmas, December 27th. And they gave me two suitcases. They gave everybody suitcases. They were full of money <laughs> to get it out of there before you. So now, you know, I'm I'm watching, I'm being becoming a part of American history, which is insane when you yeah. think about it. And these are the mover and shakers that I will travel with for the next 30 days. And then the last thing, Mo gives me a pen, a gold pen. I said, what's, I got a pen. He said, oh, no, this, this is, this is a, it's just a, a symbol of what this, what this represents for you here. You now have the power of the pen in every building casino that we're associated with. You be our guest. We know you're staying at the Sands Hotel, but you want to see a show. You want to do anything. You call these numbers. They arrange it, and when the check comes, just sign it. I mean, if they were nice to you, give it chips. We don't control that. I couldn't believe it. No. When I left there, I was, my head was spinning. And I didn't get to the hotel yet. I went from the airport there. <laughs> now I go to the airport, I mean, to the hotel, and I meet everybody that's running the Sands Hotel. Major, major guys. I heard their names. And then later on, we'll get into the Coens. And, uh, you know, Carl Cohen is the guy that knocked out Sinatra's teeth. Oh. Because he called him a guinea. <laughs> I mean, I mean he, he called him a wop. Jew. Oh. He called him a guinea. It was back and forth. And because Sinatra, most of the time, at late night, was drunk and a bad gambler. But once he, I, you know, I didn't know this till I got to know the situation there. Once he gambled more than his salary was, they wouldn't give him another dime. <laughs> oh, geez. They'd let, they'd let, you're talking out, about $100,000 a week, 50000 a week, we was getting there. So he wanted, and I love this story because, you know, to ever think the image that we all have of Sinatra, he's the most powerful. He's most powerful because of people he knows. Oh, sure. So he he got into a situation at a baccarat table. I happened to be there. Now, I met Sinatra early on because, as you know, um, Carlo Gambino, I was 12, gave me a transistor radio, and I got introduced to who Sinatra was. Realized we had the same birthday. Met him three or four years later at the Copacabana. And then here I am now hanging out with the guy. Every time he was at the Copa, I was there watching shows and talking to me, introducing me to Dean, introducing me to Sammy when the Rat Pack was there. Wow. So there was a lot of synergy in the room that was already cultivated, but it's still the mystery was to most of them, who is this kid? <laughs> No, did I always wonder because I know you were always hanging around. Did other people have young guys like you in place, or were you pretty much the youngest guy in the room? Because no, I can't. Imagine I was the younger. Oh no, I was the youngest guy. Oh no, no, nobody, nobody was. There. No, most no. of the people around the other, like the Chicago outfit and all that, they've been around them a long time before they send them down here. They call it a soft job. Now you're walking around casinos, hosting people. You're not okay. doing crimes no more. You know, and this. walk around, eyeball in the place. Okay. So with this, now I'm having a ball. I'll bet. And I couldn't even drive yet because I was only 17. And then they told me, oh, no, you could drive here at 16 to get a license in Nevada. So I, I bought a Bentley. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> Let's just, I wanted to keep my impression really... going, but the story, as, we, as we're going to get into it very intricately, it leads me to meet all of the celebrities. I'll bet. Because when I'm at the Sands Hotel watching two shows a night, and I was there as the eyes and ears of Costello, because a lot of people were coming in 
to meet JFK. JFK was there every weekend. And, you know, he had to be there because that's what his father told him to do. And that's what they needed people to get to know him. He was a senator. Nobody knew him. But, and first of all, the, the biggest obstacle he had was that he was a Catholic boy. They never had a Catholic president. Oh, wow. So with that, now I'm getting close to them. And the guy who owns the, the, the house on the property of the Sands was, was a guy called Jack Entrada. And Jack Entrada, I knew when I was first at the Copa, because he was the general manager. And then they gave it to Julie Bodell, and they sent him to the Sands Hotel to open the Copa there. Holy smokes. So it was like, you know, a home week for me. And uh and 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 then all the all of the hotels had chorus lines. Had like what? A chorus line, the Copa Girls. Oh yeah. Oh every, okay. they had them I mean, every the Follies girls, they had Lido Di Parita, they had all kinds of shows with all these because that's you know, it was all T and A to keep yeah. the gamblers going. Right, right. So, well, let's take a quick break and then I want to get back to that because uh uh, those chorus lines and those outfits, my goodness, they're so different now. I mean, I know they have a lot of shows, but they're all so different. They were so flashy and glamorous. And Oh, so. no. What they, what, I mean, when corporate got there, the mob was over with. There was no, there was not even lounge shows anymore. They made them all, they made them all slut bits. I mean, all slut, you yeah. know. It's crazy. Yeah, it's so different now. All right, let's take a quick break real quick and then uh, get back Get back to it. I love these stories. Okay. I love Las Vegas. Don't go anywhere. We know where you live. We'll be right back. Vinny from South Philly here. I'm going to tell you, I had one of the best Sunday dinners in a long time. I'm going to tell you why. Right here. Corleone, fine Italian, brother. This stuff is the real deal. Now, I know what you're thinking. Everybody knows me out there. They know. I make my own sauce. I make my own gravy. I make my own pasta. I don't buy this stuff in the store. However, however, I made an exception. Why? Because my friend Johnny Russo out there, I know what he's capable of doing. I know what he's about. He's about quality. That's so how I gotta take a shot. And I'm glad I did. Because see, I've had dinner all over the world, but this one, this product, brings me back to Italy. We got the olive oil, and I've lived in Italy, okay? I lived in Calabria, I've went to Sicily, I've been to Messina, I've been to Palermo, I've been everywhere. And this oil reminds me of an old Italian couple that my father used to buy olive oil from. They used to live in the mountains and they used to make their oil pure, pure from their own olive oil. This is it. This is it. It brings me right back to that. And you don't need a lot. You put a little bit on your salad, you marinate. It's, I mean, come on. You, you can figure it out. This is the real stuff. I also got their arrabbiata, okay? Again, I don't buy this stuff. But I made an exception. I'm glad I did. I highly, highly, highly encourage you to try this stuff. You won't be sorry. Okay? Give it a shot. You go to Corleone Fine Italian. You order it. It comes to the door. And then all we got to do is put it together. And I'm sure you can look it up. And if you don't know how to cook it, you ask me. And I'll be over for dinner. Enjoy. Salute. Okay, we're back. So, now I'm... Just the first two or three weeks, I'm, I'm going to every hotel meeting who I'm supposed to meet and like Bobby Stella and, and uh, from, from uh, Chicago. And so, like I said, every hotel had their, their property, St. Louis. I met Sarkis Webby. They own the Aladdin and right down the strip. And after that, then, you know, I got involved in some, and I love always, you know, being a, a part of the community. <laughs> so I said, what's, because I, I was staying at the hotel, and I didn't want to not leave that. No. But what went on, I, I wanted to, again, the Las Vegas Country Club, I didn't go up, I didn't want to be bothered with all of that. But the thing I did do because of the two shows a night, I went to shows constantly. And everybody got to know me because of the shows. And they were talking to me from stage. The kid is here, the kid is here, the kid is here. And so then people like Elvis, who was working, oh. just just started. He was working the Lost Frontier. For, oh, that was wow. his first job. Oh, my gosh. Parker, 
And he was doing two shows a night even then. And I watched him progress. And then there was people like a Bobby Vinton with Roses are Red, Violets are right. Blue. Every, every young performer was enamored with me being younger than them. But look, what the, who's this guy? Everybody, oh. you know, they like bow their head almost when they meet me and shake my hand, get snow checks. And one thing about a lot of entertainers, they're cheap. So right. they're and hanging you out get with me. Stuff free. The ones that have the most money and people are just bending over backwards to buy him stuff. Well, see, I didn't care because I was signing a check anyway. So they all wanted to hang out with me. Of it worked course. out perfect for me. So I mean, I got <laughs> to it was a, a situation that would you know, and I, I used to call in every every Monday. Sometimes I had to fly up to see Costello because he never talked on phones. That's why he never went to jail, but once as a younger right. person. And uh, but the the groundwork I laid was insane. And I started getting involved in businesses. Cause I always like making money. I was making money. So I I opened Johnny Russo's wig worlds. That's oh, when that, wigs were a big thing. How did you get into wigs? I mean, well, I know. I, I'm I'm I, I was started dating a lot of the chorus girls. Oh, okay. That's not a surprise, right? No, no. And no, I'd no. be backstage, oh. and they'd come off stage, perspiring, and take that wig off and put it on this little foam head. And I'm saying, do they clean that for you? So, oh, we don't care. We put it on for an hour. Okay. So, so me with my devious mind, I called the board of health. <laughs> I said, you know, my girlfriend works for XYZ. I didn't want to say who. I said, but I found out all those showgirls in every hotel, they don't take care of the wigs. They don't wash them. They don't do anything. Wow. They said, do you have proof of that? I said, I'll, I'll take pictures for you. So I did. I bought a camera. <laughs> and I went downtown, met with them. And they were saying, like, who is this guy? I said, I'm only doing it because I'm a germ germaphobic. I don't want nobody getting sick. But how right. do these girls put these heads back on? A lot of it, they were even sharing it. You know, some girls on days off, they're wearing a different oh. head. So that was my first venture with Johnny Russo Wig Worlds. And you can look up the newspapers and me written up all over the place. So what I did simultaneously, I went backstage. I met with everyone. I said, listen, you have a problem. You probably got the letter from the Board of Health. I made sure that they got sent the letter. I said, I could solve this for you. This is what you're talking about. I said, well, I own Johnny Russo Wig Worlds. He said, oh, yeah, we see them all over town. I said, yeah. I said, I could pick up the wigs on their foam heads, uh -huh. clean them, reset them for you, and bring them back. They said, you're kidding. I said, yeah, in a matter of hours, I pick them up, bring them back. Because then I staged it, you know. I do it once every two weeks, once a week, whatever they made them. I forgot what the restriction was. But they came out with the steamer. So you didn't have to do anything. You steamed the germs out. And wow. then I went to the beauty school and got all the kids who wanted to work on these wigs. And I paid them. Paid them nickels and dimes. I was getting $12 a head. Oh, which, my gosh. Which took maybe, it went in the, like a big steamer. Right. You know, 24 heads at a time. on the, I made boards. I actually made the boards. And I got the spools of the big thread because they were like on cones. So yeah. we just had this. Now you had the boards like. Flamingo Hotel, Sands Hotel. We'd put them on with numbers. They'd pick them up in the afternoon and brought them back. And we had all these kids from the school. And they were getting oh, practical. Yeah. They were learning how to finger you. waves and all that. But I mean, it was such a, a crazy. And all I was, and Costello says to me, everybody's talking about, what are you doing down here? I said, well, I'm opening these things. I got nothing to do. You know, there's so many, so many shows. Can I do what I do during the day? I do this during the day. So he, yeah. unbeknownst to me, he was telling everybody, this kid is so smart. He's making so much legitimate money down there. Gianni, that's crazy. And I, I never gambled. So I oh. kept See, that's I why you're smart. 
That's right. No, I watch these people. Lose every Who dime. Are, I mean, major guys. I mean, I I know a guy, uh, uh, Di Maselli, Frank Di Maselli. I got into, I knew him from Milwaukee and the Ballesteri brothers. He owned big steakhouses. I mean, he was worth a lot of money. In a matter of four or five years, this guy was wiped out. Oh, wiped out. And he was going to Shylock's and somebody told me, I, I said, hold on, let me talk to him. So I said, Frank, what are you doing, buddy? He said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm behind the eight ball right now. I said, you're going to be back there. Don't worry about it. You're not going to get out. He said, I got to get out. I got to get out. I watched the guy, and I helped him a lot of times. I didn't want the money back. He lost every red cent. And I watched oh. that happen not to one person, two people. They get caught up in it. They get caught up in it. And even when Sinatra used to come, every idiot who wanted to hang around Sinatra went gambling with him. You can't oh. do that. This guy's making, you know, at that time, he was still making 100000 a week. And I remember all these guys, uh, give me a marker, give me a marker. They want to say they were sh playing crap, crap or 21 with Sinatra. And and they get caught up in it. That's one thing. I capitalized on everything in Vegas. Everything. Yeah, because even one time, I remember having a conversation with, with Mo. I said, Mo, I said, I need some advice. And, and, and I tell one thing, Jewish people, I've always had them around me. I have one of my oldest, dearest friends. I will not mention his name. He's 92. Oh, We're wow. friends for 65 years. So I went to Mo. I said, Mo, what should I invest in here? He said, what are you talking about? I said, I got some money I want to invest. He said, don't invest in nothing. This town is changing everybody out. Because, you know, they, they just killed Bugsy Siegel in 1947. Because nobody realizes him in Virginia Hill skimmed oh. the money from the Flamingo Hotel. And they thought they were going to get caught. They moved $2 million. Oh, my to Switzerland. God. To Switzerland. <clears throat> and my friend, Swifty Morgan, had to bring, he was staying at Virginia Hill's house in Beverly Hills. He knew that. And they told him, bring him to her house today, a Sunday afternoon. They're both sitting on the couch across from each other. The windows are open, you know, and mm. that's how he got shot in the eye. They killed him. And then they called Virginia Hill up. They said, Virginia, I'm sorry about your loss because they were lovers. Right. You have 72 hours to go get our money unless you'll be laying next to them. <laughs> you can't, you don't can't even get these stories. Nobody knows these stories. That's crazy. I mean, it was so crazy. But Did the more I got to, what's that? Did she go get the money? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She lived a, a, a nice life after that. After oh, no. that. No, you can't. You take money from them, forget about it. No. That's insane. Well, you know, back to the wigs for just a second. I live, or I worked in a salon, and there was a wig shop next door to me. And he was the big wig guy in town, Robert's Wigs. And everybody from everywhere, they'd come from Wyoming and all over to see Cecil Roberts and mm -hmm. Robert's Wigs. And it would be so funny. We'd be sitting in there doing nails and there would go these heads of hair walking by. That's funny. I remember that name. I wondered yeah. because, yeah. Well, Mr. Roberts, Roberts was a major guy. Oh, yeah. He had, he was the guy. And I remember them saying about all the gals from other places. I'll, I think, I don't I don't know if he's, yeah, he's probably still around. But that was a place that everybody came from all over. In, in those times, that's when they were wearing wigs. They, the wigs are not where they are now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now everybody, now everybody's wearing wigs and extensions oh, and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. But, but uh, that, that, that was just introduced and I, I made a fortune with it. I mean, for years, and then I just, I gave, I think I gave them to one of my girlfriend's mother or something. I didn't, I didn't even want them. What am I going to do with it? You know, right. I had everything going. She had to give me a piece of it. But then I started buying property for Mo. He says, buy, buy land. I said, what are you talking about? He says, buy raw land. Buy raw land off the strip. It all is going to expand someday. You don't need any money. I said, no. 
I was buying acres on Colville Lane and Harmon Avenue. If you go on, there's a blank spot right there. Harmon and Flemingo Road, right next. There's 23 acres. It's still there empty. And why you don't improve it, Nevada was trying to entice people to invest money early on. In Nevada, nobody wanted to go there. I never improved it. They built all around me. I mean, the hard rock. Everything's around my property. I won't sell it. What am I? I don't need it. My grandfather told me all around. If you don't need money, don't sell anything. So I never sold it. But now forget about what it's worth. Especially property. There's a very, uh, very famous. And it's funny because, you know, people. If, and if anybody listened to the story, the doubtful Thomas is out there. Just look up. Harmon Avenue and Flamingo Road. And you'll see it's a blank piece of spot. You see the aerial shot. MGM built around me. Seasons Palace. Everybody built around me. This is still sitting there. Some of the properties are valued to remain at an acre now. I bought them for 1500 an acre. That's that crazy. And you, how many acres do you have there? I have 23 acres on that piece alone. That's and the crazy. guy I mentioned earlier, Hank Greenspun. Yeah. The, he owned this uh, Las Vegas Sun. He taught me also. He's I'm doing the same thing, but I'm I'm going further out. Today, oh, it's boy. called Green Valley after him. He he owned all that land. His kids are billionaires. Yeah. No, but it was you know it was the the guys that knew, and and listened to you know. But I I think you know, that's why to me, this is going to give me a tremendous opportunity. Fortunately to fulfill all these mailbags. We want more mail coming in. We want to right. hear the stories. I have stories. I don't care. I mean, watch these 30 years where we're going to go. You're going to find out when we had a, a major gunfight in Suite 3000 at the, at the oh. International Hotel. And on one side of the gunfight was Elvis and his guys, the Memphis mob, and then I had my guys. I, <laughs> I listen to your stories and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, did you... I, you, looking back, do you just go, what the hell were we doing? You're lucky you lived through it, but what fun memories and oh what God, yeah. amazing I mean, people into, and amazing stories you have to tell. That's the fun that, part I, about it is your your life is is so full of colorful people and you've lived to tell. You've lived to tell the story and made a dollar or two doing it. Well, I'm still living it too. I love it. Well, that's incredible. I just love love that it's so. What's that property's just sitting there and no need to sell it, so it's just no, gonna. No, I transferred it to different corporations offshore now because I don't, you know, I didn't, you know, was going through divorces and I got ten mothers oh. out of it, you know. So they all thought I owned that land. I said, "What are you talking about? I don't own nothing." Ah, <laughs> uh, that'll keep. <laughs> no, but the, that'll it's, keep the uh, bills uh, down. It, that's wild. It's all right. Crazy. Well, let's take another quick break real quick and um, get a quick break in and then get back to it because these stories are oh, yeah. fascinating. I love it. Don't go nowhere. More interesting stories, I guarantee you. That's right. Corleone Vodka on March 9th was picked as the best vodka for martinis in the world by the Rob Report. By calling 518-713-4050 or 518-713. 220-9463. It could be shipped directly to your house. The finest vodka in the world by Rob Report. Okay, we're back. All right. Well, I love I love this format because I am such a Las Vegas fan and I, I love going down there and I, I love the history of it. But so thanks for sharing and I, I love it getting to know how how Gianni Russo ran wild in Las Vegas. So speaking well, of they running only, wild. They only allowed me to do that because I know everybody. <laughs> they don't <laughs> people run wild. But I was yeah. respectful. I didn't, you know, right. I didn't abuse the privilege. That's no, I, or, Stella would have sent for me. Hello. Well, right. And you wouldn't have been successful. I think, you know, you can only no, act. I would, I, I, first of all, I would never embarrass him. What he gave right. me in my life. These are all his friends. They weren't my friends. They're his friends. Right. The only reason he gave me what I had because of him. So it's it's insane. 
Yeah. I, and you know, I, I love that. I love your um, loyalty and your respect for, for especially Costello. It just shows in everything you've done. My God. That's very neat. So speaking of uh, having some fun, what do you got coming up in the next little while? You've always got something up your sleeve. You know, that, where, where I'm going actually ties into what we just talked about. I'm going to Baku, Azerbaijan. It's between Armenia, Iran. But when I, I knew nothing about this. They invited me. And then about a week ago, they sent me all my itinerary. And you're going to, they said, you're staying at the Sea Breeze Resort. To me, it sounded like a motel in Brooklyn. What was the Sea Breeze Resort? I went online. They built a ship on land. You got to look it up. There's a full right, ship. Right. And in front of where the bow is, where the water's supposed to be, they built the swimming pools around it. So you really feel like you're on a ship. How oh, cool. But but most of the people that I'm just talking about, like the Ingelbert Humperdinks, and, uh, you know, he, uh, I mean, well, a lot of them, he's probably, he and I are probably the oldest ones going. But then you have, you know, uh, David Forrester and, and his wife and, so I'm I'm involved with the international talent show for five days. I didn't know the whole thing. It's a hundred acts from all over the world. The, we do. I mean, it's crazy. There's twenty acts a night for five days performing. Oh but my it's, god! It's going to be insane. I can't believe I'm doing this. Man, I'm at eighty-two, but I'm not the oldest one there. Ingelbert is. That's amazing. It's going to be a lot of fun. And we you know, like we're doing so many things now, fortunately. And fortunately for all of you who support us. And that's why I want to just keep everybody sending the cards and letters and supporting us. And and now we have a format for you. So tell us where you want us to go and what you want us to do. And we'll do it. And uh, right. how's, how's our petition doing for Marilyn? You know what? I have not. I have not even looked at it lately. But I'll, I'll look that up, and I'll give us a review for the next for our next show. But well, uh, California it, ruled; they saved the house. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a national monument, and I'm going to try to make it work for this lady who bought the house and bought the property, and she was going to tear down the house. So it's probably going to be a win win for everybody because I'm talking to the city of Burbank. And and Warner Brothers Studio, who's in Burbank, to get a piece of land, and we'll dedicate the land as a monument to her. Then I'll raise the money to move the house, and we'll create a lasting memory. I even want to get a body exhumed and move it to there. Oh, wow. Well, see, when I do that, I've done that one other time for somebody. When I do that, I could open up the autopsy again. Because oh, I wow. want a death certificate to be changed That's from right. suicide to homicide. Because I know who killed her. So <laughs> That's crazy. Well, I'll tell you, I know plenty of people. I was listening this morning to a podcast of people going through Graceland and, and talking about, you know, going through there and just getting to see what Elvis Presley lived like and, and his funny things that nowadays it it's, I'm sure it's quite funny because the house, I don't know how, were you ever there? At I was there so many times, but the bottom line, when you go there, you're going to be disappointed. They have shared carpet in it yet. <laughs> well, and I've heard. They can't I mean, touch it, you know. Right. And I've heard, I love his jewelry. You know me. I love the oh jewelry. Oh my God, yeah. Uh, but, uh, so people just still go to see that. Oh, and he's a legend. And funny to go you know, so I'd imagine, I know they'd love to do the same for her. The Go one through. thing he gave me, because I don't, I, I, I'm i very religious, I don't wear anything. He gave me years ago, in fact, don't even ask me how I know the jewel who made it. Mordecai Jewel is in Las Vegas. He used to order these things. It was a lightning rod. Oh, I know it. And it T -C -B. said T-C-B on it taking care of business. 
That was one of his big things. And oh, if yeah. Liked, he gave you one. It was a solid goal. Some had diamonds, some didn't. No. Like, I don't know. Oh, who. I gave it to one of my kids. But, oh, my gosh. Hmm. Hopefully he kept it. it oh, hopefully yeah. he knew. I had a friend that had a, a ring that supposedly, I don't know if it's true or not. It was Elvis's, and I can't, I don't know if he lost it or whatever he did. And every time I saw him, I'm like, I want to shake you. I, I don't know if he gave it to somebody or let somebody wear it and they lost it. And I was like, are you out of your mind? Wow. Yeah. So okay. Now. It's All time right. to sign off. That's right. Keep the cards and letters coming. That's right. Jeannie. Have a great time, my darling. Stay I will. We'll Thank talk you to you so next much. week. All right. Everybody, don't forget, share the show, follow the show, give us a like, give us a review, um, give us some show ideas. We look forward to reading those and do whatever it is you want to hear about. So thank you so much for listening. And if you got nothing to do the week of the 21st of in July, I'll be at Baku, Azerbaijan, there's five great shows. We're almost sold out. 5,000 a night, 5,000 people. What, is it recorded or like anything here? Will we be able to see it later? Do you know? What? I'm will, sorry. We be, will we be able to see it later? Oh, no, I, I don't think so, no. Oh, okay. All right, well, we'll just count I, I, You'll see it because I have it filmed. I'll send you a copy. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. All right. I like memorializing people like that. My Absolutely. Stuff. All right. Oh, thank you. Well, God time. bless you. Good night. And that was that. But I'll be back. No regrets, no complaints. Lived a life with no restraints. The little kid they all counted out. Proved them all wrong, that's without a doubt. Laying there with my left side numb. Five year bout with polio, but yes, I won. From standing all corners like how many pens you want to living in a bakery. Then opening my own restaurant. Of course, I had some help along the way. Friends like Frank Costello that I miss each and every day. Things from many years ago still resonate.